In 2009, Maurice Tomlinson became the legal advisor of marginalized groups of the well-known, respected international advocacy organization, AIDS Free World. One of his advocacy education uh, is the link between Jamaica's anti-gay laws and the spread of HIV. In his country, 32% of gay men have HIV compared to only 1.6% in the general population. Age Free World works in partnership with JFLAG, Jamaican Forum of Lesbians, All Sexuals and Gays, representatives of Jamaicans for Justice, Families Against State Terrorism, and other human rights allies. For two years, Maurice Tomlinson collected victim reports as part of a legal challenge against his nation. Since the new Jamaican Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedom does not, does not allow domestic challenges, his team engaged in an unprecedented legal challenge to Jamaica's anti-sodomy laws. Their complaint, filed in 2011 with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, ICAR, became the first regional challenge in the world of an AIDS-related issue. While ICAR can only release a recommendation to the Jamaican government, this action has placed the country's anti-gay laws in the international eye. ICAR's answer will provide a strong foundation for further in-country challenges, including the institution of anti-discriminatory statutes. From 2009 to 2011, Maurice Tomlinson held the post of lecturer of law at the University of Technology, UTech, in Jamaica. He introduced the concept of sexual diversity in his course, Discrimination Law. He married Canadian Tom Decker in August 2011 after an unauthorized public announcement in Jamaica about his marriage, he received death threats. Nonetheless, he completed his last semester of teaching, commuting from Canada to Jamaica for three days each week. He turned down the school's offer to renew his contract and began living in exile in Toronto, Canada, where he continues his work with Age Free World and lectures law at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. Tomlinson received the inaugural David Cotto Vision and Voice Award on January 29, 2012, the first anniversary of Cotto's murder for being gay. The award recognizes individuals who defend human rights and the dignity of LGBTQI people around the world. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Maurice Tomlinson. So I realize I'm going to have to do a bit of updating of that because I left AIDS Free World last year and I'm now with the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network where I pretty much continue the same work. Um, but before I begin my presentation, I want to acknowledge everyone for being here. Thank you very much for taking the time. And I also want to make a very special um, clarification. This is not Jamaica bashing. <laughs> this is about Jamaica realizing. So I always use the Jamaican flag to symbolize what I'm about to do. In Jamaica, the colors of our flag, black, green, and gold, when I grew up, were meant to symbolize black hardship, green the land, and gold the sunshine. And as you can see, there's more green and gold than black. So we don't want you to focus on the black. We have to acknowledge it and address it. But please, this is not about being negative. This is about helping Jamaica to realize some things about itself. For example, we have a strong human rights tradition. We were the first country to impose sanctions on apartheid South Africa. We were the first country to sign on to the Convention on the Rights of the Persons with Disabilities. We gave the word, you know, the, the anthem of love, one love, Bob Marley. You know, we have a, a tradition of human rights recognition and support and protection. The issue with homosexuality is a lot of internalized, imposed homophobia, which we are now trying to address, and this is how we're doing it. Now, I want to start um, or continue by talking about, see if I can get this to, ah, there it went. <laughs> this is a picture that I, um, I think is very important. 
the person holding the picture is Larry Chan. He was one of Jamaica's most prominent LGBT activists. He had to flee Jamaica um, after working in Jamaica uninterrupted for about 10 years from the 70s to the 80s. But then when things started to get very negative, he had to flee. Um, the photo he holds is that of Brian Williamson. Brian is a Canadian who came to Jamaica to live and he decided to continue working for LGBT rights. And as you heard in the movie, Brian was stabbed to death um, 79 times in his home. So those are some of the choices that people make. You stay and you could face death or you flee. Now um, Larry has left everything. He left his family a very good business and he now lives in Thailand. He initially moved to the States and he now lives in Thailand. Um, the level of homophobia in Jamaica was measured in 2011 at nearly 82%. Last year, we did another measure. It had increased to 91%. The reason is because of marriage equality. There's been a, a, you know, a fomenting of hate because of the fear that this is going to lead to marriage equality. Decriminalizing sodomy is going to lead to marriage equality. We also find a correlation in Jamaica between the level of homophobia and the level of HIV. We have in Jamaica the highest HIV prevalence rate among men who have sex with men in the Western Hemisphere, if not the world. One in three gay men has HIV and AIDS. Right? And we know that's because gay men are driven underground and MSM are driven underground away from pre effective prevention, treatment, care, and support interventions. And some of these men are also forced to have relationships with women to mask or cure their homosexuality. I got married to a woman because although she knew about my orientation, we believed what the church said. Regular straight sex and prayer would cure me. Right? It didn't. Um, thankfully, we, we still maintain good relationships. But these are some of the realities. This is how we are portrayed in the media in, in Jamaica still. This is the Jamaica Observer, which is owned by Jamaican mogul, Butch Stewart, who also owns Sandals Resorts. Sound familiar? This is what your money supports. Mm. So why is Jamaica so homophobic? Well, a lot of it now is because of domesticated hate being spewed by our religious leaders. Jamaica is not a quiet society, right? And our churches are very important because everybody has to go to church. It's not an option. Growing up, you had to go to church. And the pastors in Jamaica preach a lot of anti-gay rhetoric because it's very popular. You cannot preach against promiscuity in Jamaica because 85% of our population is born out of wedlock. You cannot preach against alcohol because there's a bar in front of every church. But you could preach about homosexuality because in the 80s, <coughs> when the evangelicals started coming, they lost the culture war north and they started coming to Jamaica in droves, they started twinning homosexuality with AIDS. And so that's the one thing nobody wanted to be associated with. Now they're twinning homosexuality with marriage equality. And again, there's a fear of what's going to happen to the children. Right? Now, our musicians grew up in this culture of intolerance. Everybody goes to church, as I said. And they recorded what they knew. Just natural. And we have the, the highest per capita of homophobic songs of any nation. Over 200 plus. Right? And these songs call for the murder of gays, the rape of lesbians, you name it, the burning, killing, you name it. And again, as I said, we're not a quiet society. So this, this music is played on buses, in taxis, everywhere. And that's Monday to Friday. Then on Saturday or Sunday, depending on when you go to church, it's reinforced by our preachers. Okay? So you almost have what is called a perfect storm of homophobia. We've also gotten lots of help from the Global North, because we have evangelical preachers, come lawyers, <laughs> uh, who come to Jamaica and they have access to our parliaments, to our policymakers, and they basically say, no, 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 you can't adopt the equality provisions in Canada elsewhere because it's going to lead to the horrors of marriage equality. So this is Dr. Janet F. Buckingham, and she's particularly problematic because she came from Trinity Western University, which is a school in, in British Columbia, to Jamaica when we were discussing revising our Charter of Rights. And Jamaica basically took the Canadian Charter as a Commonwealth country, and we were going to do a cotton paste. And she said, no, 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 you have to be careful, because if you do, it's going to lead to 
this, these terrible things that they happen, happen in, have in Canada, such as marriage equality. And the government listened to her because, well, she should know. She's a PhD in law, and she's, you know, the path of her religion was ignored. What? <laughs> and she's white, yes, I, 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 I'll say it for you. <laughs> the, the reality is that, you know, race does play a big part in Jamaica. We listen to white foreigners more than we listen to, um, you know, black domestic people. And in Jamaica, our charter, which we adopted, does not provide any protection for sexual orientation. As a matter of fact, we have a closed charter. The discrimination section doesn't have all other status. There's no capacity for that, thanks to Janet A. Buckingham. And we also, for the first time, included our new reference to non-discrimination on the grounds of being male or female. We deliberately excluded sex because sex was what was used in Canada to include sexual orientation. And we also, for the first time in 2011, introduced a ban on any form of same-gender relationship recognition. Now, no Jamaican LGBT organization has been asking for marriage equality. Remember, 85% of our population is born out of wedlock. It's not a, marriage is not a big deal for Jamaicans, period. I used to do divorce law, and I always tell people, marriage is the cause of divorce. Think about it. <laughs> because most people have been living together for years and they'll be fine. It's the minute they decide to get married that they feel trapped and then they rush to, you know, and it's like, seriously, you guys have grandkids. Why did you mess it up? <laughs> anyway, and our, our politicians have also contributed to it. So even though our, our then prime minister, she's since been voted out this year, she initially said she'd call for decriminalization and then she backed away um, in 2014 because of pressure from the church. She says she will not call for decriminalization because it does not concern the majority of Jamaicans who are poor. The current prime minister, the gentleman there um, at the top, he said the law must be put to a public vote. And remember what I said, the last time we did a poll, it was at 91% homophobic. The poll will be pointless. Right? Below are our former and current, no, our former Minister of Justice and our former Attorney General. There are two separate offices in Jamaica. And both of them have gone international and said, no, 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 we don't have any problems with gays in Jamaica. There's no violence. We also have politicians using homophobic songs as their theme songs in their campaigns. So what are some of the results of homophobia? This is Dwayne Jones. Dwayne was a 16-year-old youth who went to uh, street dance dressed as she identified. Duane had been kicked out at 14 years old because she's trans and she kept using the name Duane. And when Duane went to the street dance dressed as she identified, a female member of her church outed her to the mob. They stabbed, shot, ran over Duane with a car and then threw her body in the bushes and went back to dance. This is since 2013. There have been no arrests because nobody will come forward. Right? The, we have a chronic problem with homeless LGBT youth. These are, these are some youth living in sewers, which is where they're forced. We keep kids out as young as 10 because they are an abomination. And if you keep an abomination in your home, oops, sorry, as a lecturer, I know this is a no no. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, we keep kids out as young as 10 because we say if they stay in their home, they will attract the wrath of God, right? And so these kids live in sewers. Many of them, they are sex workers. They sell sex to survive. And they're paid extra for condomless sex, mostly by men with female partners, because they happen to be gay, but this is the only way they can express their sexuality, because in Jamaica, they have to have a female partner. The result is that there's a bridging of the HIV into the general population, right? So there's a public health crisis. This is some home invasions which happen you know, quite frequently. Gays are chased out of their homes when people just get tired of them in the community. You don't know what's gonna spark it, right? They've been living here for years and you're fine and then boom, right? Um, trans are mobbed in the streets, gays are mobbed, and again, you don't know what's gonna spark it. And as I was explaining to Tammy, one of the interesting phenomena is that many of the persons who incite violence are female, right? Women are the ones inciting these attacks. Right? See here, this is a typical example of an attack. Women beating up on a trans individual. This is how we're represented, again, by the Jamaica Observer, owned by Sandals Resort. 
This is how they represent us in the media. When we confront them, they say, well, you know, racism has been declared um, bad, but this is what the editor of the Observer said, but homophobia has not yet. And therefore, I am at liberty to publish these kinds of cartoons, which basically make us all to be freaks. Our, this is the president of the Jamaica Teachers Association. And this year, beginning of this year, he said that no teacher will provide any counseling or support for any LGBT youth because being gay is illegal. So once the student identifies, they will report the student to the proper authorities. Right? So what have we done? We have done some police LGBT sensitivity training. My husband used to be the Toronto police LGBT liaison officer. That is after he left the Catholic Church. That's another story. Um, <laughs> and it's been very well received. We've done it in six countries across the Caribbean. We've also done advocacy training for groups on the ground to try and help them to be more um, you know, robust in their documentation because that's critical. Uh, the politicians are very easy to say there's no evidence of any abuse unless you have your, your documentation. We also do public demonstrations. We call them pop-up protests. They last for no more than five minutes. They're around the island and they're completely unannounced because if we were to have a public, you know, um, thing, we'd probably attack, attract, a pre-announced thing would probably attract a lot of um, challenges. And so one of the things we're doing this weekend is we're having Montego Bay Pride, right? And uh, yes, it's a bit a little challenging for you to get away, but if you can, you're certainly invited to come down. <laughs> and again, it's at a secret location. Persons have to pre-register. They don't know where it's going to be. Um, we tell them the night before. We have a van that picks them up and transports them. All of this is very clandestine because we cannot pre-announce it. And then our, our march is really a mobile, and I'll show it in a bit, a mobile um, thing where we drive around on a bus, we jump out for five minutes, we do our flag waving, and we jump back in, we go to another location and do that again. Then about five times. That's how you have to do it. Because the last time I tried to get police protection for one of the, the marches, the police lost, my, lost the request four times. And then they, well, after I did a solo sit-in at the police station, they finally showed up with one man on a bike. He rode at the front of the parade. Because if anything went down, he was out of there. Because mm -hmm. we were on our own. All right, so we said we're not going to do that again. We've also tried to air some um, tolerance ads on TV, and you can get the, I'll, I'll email this to you, Tammy, so you can share it around. And one of the ads was aired. It basically just says, you know, respect the rights of LGBT people to prevent um, HIV. The rest, because the churches got wind of them, were not. So they have um, blocked the television stations from airing any more tolerance ads. We've met with our ambassadors overseas and say, look, you know, this is our ambassador to the United States. You've worked with gays. They're okay. Can you take the message back home, please? Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. We go to the OAS where we can confront our government directly because they will not meet with us domestically. But we confront them at the OAS. And this is me embarrassing the Jamaican government who was just about to speak. Um, we've also, for the first time, created a lesbian organization in Jamaica because the, the issues around gay men, around gay men, are normally given priority, but not so much the issues around lesbian, uh, surrounding lesbians. Okay, speak up the time. And um, we've had some horrendous abuses. For example, this is a lesbian who was um, raped, and she decided to start her own organization called Quality of Citizenship Jamaica, and we helped to get some funding for her. We've had instances of corrective rape. One lesbian was raped by four men, and when they were finished, they used a knife to cut her vagina because they said the reason she was a lesbian was because she was too tight. She did not report it to the police because reporting it to the police would make it worse. Most of our lesbians are caregivers, and like most women in the Caribbean, they're taught to just take it. Right? It's their fault. So this is a real chronic problem which we're trying to get to the, um, the public stage, and it's, it's proving challenging because they won't report, and I understand why. We've also done this film which we take around to try and educate people so that they can help with the response. And as you see, it's not about talking heads, it's about showing the human side. And we've shown this quite a few times in Jamaica because we know it, people are struggling with the issue until they get to realize, but they probably know someone who is gay or lesbian. We've started a shelter called Duane's House, or we're trying to, we're trying to raise funds for it. We're trying to help these youth get out of their sewers. Um, the, U the UK government initially had said they were going to fund it, and then because of the Syrian crisis, they pulled all the funding. 
So that went south, right? We've met with, Amer with leaders from around the world. It's me with the very attractive pre Prime Minister of Canada. No, you all can't come after Trump. Mm. No. <laughs> Stay. <laughs> um, but yes, um, you know, we've tried to encourage them to engage with our leaders respectfully because we don't want any catastrophe. This can happen when a leader does it wrong. For example, when the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Canada engaged with the public, the, prep, the, sorry, the Speaker of the House of Uganda about LGBT rights in Uganda, he was so abrasive that the Speaker of the House, who had been ambivalent about their anti sodomy law, said, look, Uganda is not a vassal state of Canada. And she went back home and she ran through the anti sodomy law, which imposed the life imprisonment for being gay. It was subsequently thrown out by the courts, but she said she's going to bring it back, just to prove a point. Okay, so we have to engage with leaders like, look, careful how you do this. We've also launched some cases to challenge the anti sodomy law. So, in your packages, I'm sorry for those who didn't have enough time, they didn't tell me how many to bring, it's time as well. <laughs> we, we challenged the law of Belize and Trinidad, which banned the entry of homosexuals. We challenged it before the Caribbean Court of Justice. The CCJ ruled this year that. Well, the law isn't really that bad because it's not that it's not being enforced. So if you go there and they turn you back, then you can bring a claim. But until they turn you back, so that's kind of the, the awkward situation we're in. Um, but they got we, the benefit of the case was it established at the level of the Caribbean Court of Justice that gays have rights. They've never had a pronouncement like that before. Right? We also um, have filed, well I'll get to that last, we filed a challenge before the Court of Appeal in Jamaica, or an appeal before the Court of Appeal, um, challenging TV stations that refuse to air an ad calling for respect for the rights of gays. Now in Jamaica we can sue private individuals for constitutional breaches because we have horizontal application of rights. That's I think only three other countries in the world that have that. Um, South Africa and Ireland and I can't remember the, the third. But we can sue for private breaches. So we sued them using a lot of American cases, you know, CBS, etc., etc., which basically said that um, the television license is different from the press because it's a very limited resource. We, they have the, the television stations have patrimony which they have a license over, which they must use for the benefit of society. Right? The law court didn't agree with us, so we're about about we're at the court of appeal and the court will hopefully deliver its judgment soon. One of the benefits of this case, though, was that the president of the panel, even at the court below, said, even though gays are not in the Constitution specifically mentioned, it is to be assumed that, as a Jamaican, we're entitled to all the rights. So she read in, thankfully, um, homosexuals into our Constitution, which is one of those cases where you lose, but you might have won something. Right? So we can use that for other cases. And we've also challenged the Jamaican anti-sodomy law domestically. In addition to the inter-American challenge which you've seen, we've challenged the Jamaican anti-sodomy law domestically um, because we think we found a way to change this, to, to challenge it. This is it. The law basically says that you must go to prison for up to 10 years for any act of intimacy between two men, including holding hands in the privacy of your bedrooms. The law cannot be challenged unless it is changed. That's what our constitution says. It cannot be challenged unless it is changed. That law came from 1864. But in 2012, we changed, we think, the law, we say we think, <laughs> we'll see if the court agrees with us, that by adding a sex offender registry, which was included in 2012, we have changed the law. Now, after 2012, if you are convicted of same gender intimacy, you must now register as a sex offender you must carry a pass at all times. And if you don't have it, you must pay a $1 million Jamaican, 10,000 US, fine, plus 12 months in prison, as I said, for each offense, okay? So we say by adding those requirements, we have changed the law. The question is, is a sex offender registry punishment or is it an administrative requirement? Some courts have not quite settled that point and we are saying it's a punishment, right? Um, so those are the challenges we have filed and we are also thinking about something called an advisory opinion which we are trying to get from the Inter-American Court which basically would declare whether the anti-sodomy laws in the other Caribbean countries, including Jamaica, 
violate the American Convention on Human Rights. That is provided for under Article 64 of the American Convention. I'm giving you a whole lot of law, which I'm sure you'll love to go and research. <laughs> right, Tammy? <laughs> we have a public forum to discuss LGBT rights in Jamaica and what, should, what we should do. And as I said, we've, we've held Montego Bay Pride. This is our second year. And this is my dad, who was an evangelical, as Pentecostal as they come. But after working with me and my husband for a while, he's now become pro-gay to the point where he helps me plant pride. Okay, and he drives around with this rainbow flag on his bus because he doesn't want anybody messing with his son. And we drive and we stop and do our little flash dance and we drive and we do our... So that's, that's how we do pride with daddy at the helm. We've also done protests in United, uh, in Canada and wherever they are to make our consulates, etc. Because again, we cannot get to the government at home. So we have to use whatever we can internationally. We've gone to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights with the petition that you heard about. Ironically, the person in the center is Tracy Robinson, who was the special rapporteur for LGBT rights in the um, inter-American system. She's Jamaican. But she couldn't touch the issue of LGBT rights in Jamaica while she was special rapporteur. Because you can't. It's a conflict of interest. So that was pretty annoying. <laughs> but the person to her left, Rosemary Bell Antoine, was my lecturer in discrimination law at the University of the West Indies. So she's a, we have a name, and she's a, she's a, she was a rapporteur on HIV. Sadly, both of them have now left the commission, but while they were there, they were able to make some true submissions. We're also working with religious leaders. This is Father Sean Major Campbell, an Anglican priest, who washed the feet of lesbians on World Human Rights Day 2014. This caused a near riot, because it meant public. But he has since become more strident in support of LGBT rights in Jamaica, and that's been wonderful. Now we're in a campaign called Anglicans for Decriminalization, or oh, sorry, here you call them Episcopalians, you post-colonials. Uh, <laughs> rebellious colonials. Um, yes, so we're trying to get all the Anglicans slash Episcopalians to sign a petition calling for decriminalization. And if you want more information about it, please let me know. Um, some results, we've seen some positive editorials from newspapers in Jamaica. We also had the mayor, this is the mayor of Kingston, speaking at Pride, not to make Montego Bay Pride, but Jamaica Pride last year in support of LGBT rights. She got backlash and she's become, and that's the thing, you know, once you make that first step, one of two things will happen. You'll either become more supportive or you'll retreat. The prime minister retreated. The mayor of Kingston has become more strident in support because she, she realized what it's like for us now living that reality. Right? We've had what I call civil war between families. <laughs> on the left here is uh, Keon West, and on the right is his father, Wayne West. Wayne West is the leader of the homophobic movement in Jamaica. He's the leader of the anti-gay movement. He's a cardiologist and traffics on his medical credentials to say, well, he can speak about the connection between homophobia or homosexuality and AIDS. You know, and that's what he's saying. Homosexuality leads to AIDS. Homosexuality leads He's not an epidemiologist. He's just a medical doctor, but that's enough. His son grew up in that home. His son eventually became a Rhodes Scholar, but he left um, his father's home being rabidly homophobic, came to the United States to study, and as fate would have it, he ended up with a gay roommate. <laughs> and he was challenged, but he got in trouble on campus once, and the only person who came to his aid was his gay roommate. And since then, it started to force him to rethink all his negative thoughts about gays. And since that, he's become pro-gay to the point where he has written, um, you know, scholarly works. He's now a Rhodes Scholar, PhD sociologist on how to help people move from homophobic to inclusive. Um, and his father has disowned him. <coughs> this is the cost of being tolerant. It can lead to family breakdown in Jamaica. We've had the Minister of Health come out in support of LGBT rights, but not decriminalization, because that's, that's the, the, the schizophrenia. We had Diana King, a Jamaican lesbian who lives in Florida, come out as the first openly lesbian LGBT Jamaican musician, right? Um, people have said, well, she lives in Florida, she can get rid of it, but the point is she was very, very popular, is very popular in Jamaica, so that was significant. We've had the American ambassador for LGBT rights, Randy Berry, and his um, adv uh, advisor, Todd Larson, come to Jamaica and meet with government officials and also meet with the LGBT community visibly. And that's important because then it gives us some respectability and access which we never had before. 
right? This is when President Obama visited Jamaica last year on my birthday, and this is not Photoshop. This actually happened. When he was leaving, <laughs> there was a rainbow, and his photographer was there just in time. And why I put this picture is because we helped, really, to help um, President Obama's team to make sure that there wasn't a misstep. We said, you know, you can't go there and finger wag at Jamaica. It's going to inflame nationalistic fervor. Talk about um, the benefits of inclusion. Talk about respecting rights and what it has done for the society. But please avoid the, the finger wagging. And you did. And it went over wonderfully. Yes, there were a few nutters who were trying to, um, you know, protest him. But at his public forum in Kingston, he asked for Angeline, the lesbian who formed her LGBT organization, he asked her to stand up. And she did. And people applauded her. Because for the first time, they realized it wasn't about beating up on it, on the nation. It was about acknowledging that we can do this. And that's how we framed it. And it was wonderful. They've had some backlash. Some of the fundamentalists now have joined the religious, the, the case that I've challenged, um, the anti-sodomy law. There are nine religious groups that are now in the case supporting the retention of the anti-sodomy law because they say it's necessary to prevent the extinction of mankind. I am not kidding. This is in their affidavit. I am not kidding. And the judge ruled that the religious groups could be in the case, but the public defender could not. So he excluded the public defender as an interested party. Because to him, we needed to preserve the, um, the neutrality of the public defender. And if the public defender was seen to be defending LGBT rights, then nobody would want to go and access that service anymore. Right? Nonsense ruling, of course, and it's now being appealed and we're joining that appeal. We have seen some visits recently by some of your best and brightest. I'm being very sarcastic. Uh, <laughs> these are some of the, the evangelicals, homophobic, who come to Jamaica on a regular basis. And they are having access to a parliamentarian, again, because of the whole marriage equality debate. So we've done the AIDS thing, now we're talking about prevent marriage. And they're coming from UK as well. You're not the only ones to blame, but you know, they're there. These fundamentalists are now using our tactics. Some of the protest actions we've done, they're starting to use them, right? And they're also going to the OAS. Before, they never used to be visible. Now they're there in droves. And the last time we were at the OAS, they were there and they were so powerful that the states were, were caught off guard. Because the, at the OAS, normally the states are the ones being urged to be more progressive. But when, because of the power of the evangelicals, the states were being told, no, 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 we don't want LGBT rights. You're, you're trafficking, you're trespassing on our right to freedom of religion. And the states were like, what the what? <laughs> One, this is the, I will never forget this. They had a um, 70 odd year old disabled Latina complain that the resolution or convention on the rights of the, of the elderly should not include sexuality because she's over 70. What does she care about sex? Literally, this is the reasoning of these people, <laughs> okay? So they're, they're pushing back at the levels of the OS and the UN and making the states now think, well, okay, if they don't want it, then why am I, why am I going out on a limb? So it's really distressing. And I'll close with this. How we have been encouraging Global North allies to respond, I summarize in three letters. Acknowledge, respect, and engage, A-R-E. Acknowledge that a lot of the homophobia we are experiencing in the Global South came from the Global North. Okay, let's face it, we were taught to hate. Right? Also acknowledge that you are challenged and struggling with homophobia yourselves. Do not do the finger wagging without doing a little introspection. Okay? Just remember Orlando. That should put it in context for you. You have some work to do there. So that helps you to keep humble. Then respect. Respect our local leaders. They may be bastards, but they are our bastards. <laughs> okay? And unless you come with that level of engagement, that, you know what, I'm respecting you because the people elected you, and yes, you may be the Trump of Jamaica, but still, I'm sorry, I'm being popular. <laughs> but it's still, you, you elected them, you know? We have to deal with it. So respect our leaders, and respect that there are people on the ground who are also doing work. So don't think we need to be saved, eh? We can do our own saving. Um, we just need you to come along with us when you engage. That's the last one. Engage as equals. Engage by selling the positives of inclusion. So, talk about what we heard today at the breakfast. 
that inclusion leads to um, greater productivity, reduced HIV, you know, um, the risk of women not knowing who they're sleeping with, if their husbands are gay or what. Those things you sell as positives, because people get that. I remember even the Minister of Justice in Jamaica, who is dead set against decriminalization because it, he hasn't gotten a political mandate, he said to me, you know what, I'm realizing that recognizing the rights of gay men is also a women's rights issue because women are vulnerable because of the laws. Thank you. Did anyone have any questions? Did you enjoy? Do, do you feel that you're more educated about this issue? Do you consider yourself an ally? Yes, please. Yes, Terry. I have a question. Um, I was sit sitting here and I was thinking to myself as I've been to Jamaica and I'm, and I'm wondering how they view this knowing that um, tourists are coming to Jamaica and they're staying in some of the resorts that Jamaica highlights, uh, as you probably know, hedonism resorts, where open sexuality is taking place and there is a lot of um, gay and lesbian sex right. going on at hedonism places. And those are places that a yeah. lot of foreigners visit and pay a lot of money to go to and yeah. engage in Jamaica. So two things quickly. Um, I know you didn't mention it, but I never ever support a boycott of Jamaica because I like to explain that Jamaica is a very tiny island. And if you want to understand how difficult it would be, think of the smallest town in Florida, then surround it by a moat and fill it with sharks. Okay? If we impose the boycott, the gays would be vulnerable and they would have nowhere to go because getting a visa is not easy. Right? And so we have to be careful we can't be scapegoated by being the cause of an economic downturn because after remittances, tourism brings in the highest um, amount of revenue. Now, so yes, please come, but when you're there, please use the opportunity to engage your server, whoever, um, taxi driver, you know, about the issue of LGBT inclusion. Secondly, there are very inclusive resorts. I did a, I did a, a, a publication, you know, little blog on what I call the 26 truly inclusive resorts. Because amazingly, in the resorts, there's a very strong diversity training program going on. But that's in the resorts. And a resort is a very artificial environment, to put it mildly, <laughs> right? The government, of course, will wink and close its eyes to that, and nobody would dare say anything because we depend on tourism. But that, again, reinforces the idea that homosexuality is foreign, right? It's okay for the foreigners. But don't you dare be a Jamaican gay person. There are people who would come out of the hotels and beat up on gays and go back and smile and serve a gay person because it's their job. And that is the problematic thing. So how do we normalize homosexuality? We have to have gays in Jamaica being visible. Yes, sir. From what I saw in the video, his um, his partner is um, was once or I guess um, I don't know if someone called the police or like someone was working with the church and got expelled because of his um, um, I don't know what reason that I don't know how long I was here maybe it has to do with like his um, anxiety. So for me, I'm coming from a different part of the world and I really struggled with um, even my background, I. I realize when it's easier for someone who studies law to accept or to tolerate other people than someone who doesn't have that kind of background. And most, most of the things we saw when I was in the military, I realized that even the president of this country had to struggle, had to evolve. When he had to like um, make sure that um, they pass the um, don't they get killed, don't ask, don't tell, he struggled with it. So it's, at, at some point, he it's, said it's, it's a religious evolution. Yes, you, you, you have to transform, and and it looks like the movement is like going against or like trying to, 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 to shatter the the, 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 the the fortress that has been built by uh, religious work across the world. 
So it's like it's not just about Christianity, it's also even the even the Muslim states, right? Right. They, they, they have this foundation whereby the notion of um is incompatible with right. you know, um, homosexuality. So my question is um what what have you learned from him? Like someone who has had that evolution. Right. Like the partner has had that evolution. And he's like because it's easier for someone it is easier for me to talk about gay rights if I'm not than for someone who is gay to talk about. Right. For me, a, a, like the president could easily repeal the has of terror because he is he he, he, he is not right. a, a gay person. But for someone who is gay to do it is harder. So how how have you learned from him? Right. From so I, I, I take your point. Um, I was sharing with Tammy today. We never ever in this work now talk about ignorance. There's a lack of knowledge, and it's all about education. <clears throat> and a lot of the evolution that people have made comes from experiencing someone who is LGBT. They have to know someone because, contrary to what you say, it's not it's not um, easier for educated persons to be tolerant. No. The chief lawyer in the case that I'm in, that is defending the anti-sodomy law on behalf of the church, is the former Attorney General of Jamaica. The Solicitor General of Jamaica was a part of one of the religious groups that I'm opposing now in the anti-sodomy law case. The current Attorney General of Jamaica belongs to one of those religious groups. So it's not easier because you're a lawyer to appreciate human rights. It doesn't work that way. It comes from experiencing and realizing there's nothing to fear. But the fear can only be unpacked through exposure, through experience. And that's what we're about. Getting people to meet, um, getting LGBT people to be visible. Um, that's why coming out, day is, coming out day is so important because you're not only saving your own life, you're also saving the lives of others. Because once family members realize that, you know what, I'm making jokes about my own family, friend, etc then they become less intolerant. So a lot of what Mr. Obama and everybody else has experienced what they've all is because they have had the opportunity to meet with LGBT people and realize they're not that freaky and scary, which is why we're doing these ads, etc., etc., trying to be, to try to make it less scary to be gay. We can talk after. Let's <laughs> see so other questions. Professor Pingree. Yeah, I, I want to stand <clears throat> out of respect to you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming. My pleasure. We work very hard here to try and teach our students about professionalism. And I've asked my sexual orientation class to come. And I just want to say, this is what courage looks like. This is what change looks like. This is what making a difference looks like. This, this is why I'm an ally. It's easy for me. But I look at people like this. And I say, shame on anybody who isn't brave enough to stand up and support it. So I thank you for coming. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you for taking the time. Sir. A, a young man at the back had a question. Oh, you, yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed in the video that there was that initially was a, uh, um, I guess, a gun call for repeal of the anti sodomy law. But, um, and, but then eventually, I believe it was the Prime Minister, I believe, Bush, and Senator Miller, who, uh, who, who was more of a push for a review versus a repeal. Like, is it because of the fact, like you said, uh, uh, I guess the rhetoric has even pushed even further that, that uh, the whole community as a whole does not want, like, really against the whole repeal of it? Is that why it's lessened to review versus a repeal? Like, why is like, why that? Uh, Right, so the, that, the challenge is that how our Sexual Offenses Act is written, if we get rid of the Bogri law, then there's nothing in the law that would criminalize forced anal intercourse at all. Because how we've defined rape, it is only penal vagina. Okay? So we do not consider penal anal intercourse as rape. So we have to keep the Bogri law, but we have to decriminalize private, consensual, <laughs> same-gender intimacy. So that's why we're saying 
it's not even just a review, it's a reading down which we're asking for. And I'm not going to go into the nuances of the complicating factors that will arise if we get rid of it, but the reality is if we get rid of the anti bubble law, then raping boys would be legal. So on, on that point, um, when the South African Constitutional Court reviewed their country law and struck it down, they had the same exact issue. And the court simply just rewrote right. the law effectively for right now. Maybe the Jamaican courts wouldn't do that and be so bold. But that's what, that's what South Africa did. They, they confronted the issue. They said, so problem. You know, we can just we can just extend the definition of rape right. to its normal international standard, right? They use right. comparative evaluation and fill the gap that way. Yes. And our courts are not that progressive. And it, the reality is um, many of our judges are very influenced by evangelical faith. So I'm not hopeful at the first instance anyway. Perhaps when we go to the Court of Appeal, when there's a little more, as I said, like to say, a little more exposure of our judges, and certainly when we get to the Privy Council, which is still our final Court of Appeal, the Privy Council in England, we may have such a judgment. But the Privy Council itself has also been very hesitant when it comes to constitutional matters. It tends to defer to the local courts, which is maddening. <laughs> you know, like we, the reason we keep you is because we expect that there are issues which our local judges may not be able to see the bigger international perspective. So, yes, I'm hoping that the reading down happens. I really am hoping, but I don't know that they will go as far as to extend the definition of rape. I think they will say if Parliament had wanted to do that, they would have done it. Any other questions? Well, thank you all very much for coming. Please, let's give another hand to Maurice Thomas. And before I go, thank you very much for having me.